uh, bring up Daniela's slides. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Katrina Cano and I'm a PhD researcher at KU Leuven in Belgium. Welcome to the first of our new monthly series, Carbon Pricing Conversations. In this monthly webinar, we facilitate dynamic conversations with researchers from around the world on all things carbon pricing. These webinars are organized by the ERC-funded research group Polycarbon, which is led by Professor Katia Biedenkopf and consists of five PhD students setting the trends for the expansion and contraction of carbon pricing policies. Today's conversation will be with Professor Daniela Stevens, who will discuss her recently published Global Environmental Politics article, The Potential of Co-Benefits to Spur Subnational Carbon Pricing in North America, a Qualitative Comparative Analysis. Professor Stevens works at the Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas, or CITE, in Mexico, and Professor Stevens' research focuses on the political economy of climate change. We are also joined in conversation with our discussant, Professor Barry Rabe. Professor Rabe works on environmental and public policy at the University of Michigan in the United States. So today's conversation will begin with Professor Stevens presenting her recent, uh, recently published article, and then Professor Rabe will respond with comments and explain on the discussion uh, to include his own research. After that, we'll take comments and questions from the audience. And if you would like to ask a question during the Q&A, you can just raise your hand with the Microsoft Teams function, and I can call on you in order of the raised hands. Once called on, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question. Also, as a reminder, the webinar is recorded and will be posted online in the coming days. So without further ado, we'll now open up Daniela's PowerPoint and we will begin. Let's see. And then Danielle, you can just tell me whenever I should switch uh, the slide. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. You let me know when I should start. OK, absolutely. I'm just trying to find. This one. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, you can. Yes, OK, I'll go ahead and mute myself and then just let me know when to go to the next one. All right, thank you so much for the invite. Um, thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Katia. I'm honored to open the webinar series with this paper about carbon pricing in North America. Thank you so much, Professor Ray, for joining us in the conversation. Too. Uh, can you? Uh, thank you, Katrina. So this is um, my agenda for these 15 minutes. I'll present the, this paper on carbon pricing in North America, my motivations, theory, research design, and some of the conclusions. And um, then I'll present briefly one of the papers that I'm working on um, that in fact stems directly from the conclusions of the previous paper on, on global environmental politics. I have a couple of questions for you, um, the conversations, one about method and the other one about how you deal with carbon pricing research and external validity in general. I'll lay out all of this in 15 minutes, I promise, to have time for your questions, for your comments. Um, so can we go to the third slide? The motivation for this paper came on the one hand uh, from the observation that we tend to study the adoption of carbon pricing, and that is very much justified. Um, but it also poses problems of selection bias that can lead to not so sound conclusions of the reasons behind adoption. Uh, so I had the curiosity to study the reasons behind non-adoption as well. On the other hand, I chose to focus specifically on subnational carbon prices in the region because these jurisdictions are pioneers in carbon pricing. And according to conventional wisdom, um, they are pioneers because they got somewhat impatient with the national inaction and the international impasse and decided to act accordingly. 
So the objective of the paper was twofold. Number one, to find the reasons behind adoption and non-adoption, and number two, to problematize our understanding of subnational climate action, considering states and provinces as agents, not only as reactive entities, but as actors with interests, with motivations that may or may not include the federal designs. Um, theoretically, I rely on political economy explanations, on specifically on the distributed politics literature, so I consider costs and benefits. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. On the side of costs, I um, hypothesize and test whether the presence of emission intensive trade exposed industries with higher risk of carbon leakage plays a role in non-adoption if somehow um, these industries attempted to block a policy considering that they bear the costs of pricing emissions and of course depending on the risk of carbon leakage that they face. Um, I also noticed that um, the literature on distributed politics has focused on costs. So on the side of benefits, I hypothesize and test that co-benefits, the co-benefits of, of mitigation, those additional to the emission reduction benefits, are one of the multiple motivations that subnational jurisdictions have to adopt carbon pricing. I'll be the very relevant one because they represent a credible commitment that gives governments some sort of compensation to fight, um, as Catherine Harrison would say, the uphill battle of pricing carbon. And I assume uh, that a policy is more stringent if it covers an industry with high risk of carbon leakage than medium or low. Um, and that policies that cover entities with low risk are merely symbolic. I take co-benefits as a potentially sufficient condition that nonetheless interacts with the presence of emission intensive trade exposed industries with high risk of carbon leakage to produce the results in this table that we can discuss further if you wish during the Q&A session. But in short, it's a two by two table in which uh, my two conditions of interest combine to produce different results. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. I'm doing this like super fast to have <laughs> some some time for for the conversation, which is the most interesting part of the of the webinar. As for my research design, I use a qualitative comparative analysis, which I found suitable because I talk about conditions, not about cause effect. Also, given the set theoretic nature of my expectations, if co-benefits, then this will likely happen, or if there is an industry with these characteristics, this is likely to happen. Um, and also given the, the, the N of 54, um, I calibrate co-benefits as a binary condition and risk of carbon leakage in different iterations, I, I try different ways. Um, I, I try to calibrate them as a matter of degree or as binary. And I also include an alternative way to gauge how a policy may affect industry regarding its scope. So I consider whether it affects one or multiple sectors of the economy, if it covers one or multiple sectors. Um, I consider alternative explanations such as the level of federalism. And since we're discussing taxes, I include another condition that I, I first did not contemplate it at all, but I eventually introduced it purely from uh, inductive reasoning. And this condition indicates whether the jurisdiction has a history of rejecting tax reform. This may indicate fiscal autonomy, but um, it also specifies if the population in general um, historically opposed additional pricing mechanisms. And there are a few jurisdictions in my in my end that that do, including Alberta, including Washington, Oregon. And the expectation is that carbon pricing initiatives from these governments face more opposition. Um, the QCA also included alternative, other alternative explanations as uh, whether a federal carbon price exists or other partisanship related conditions. In my data, I have 22 cases of adoption contained in 12 empirically occurring configurations, and I have 32 cases of non-adoption within 19 combinations. Next slide, please. Um, the results support the hypothesis, but only partially. Um, I obtained three combinations that lead to adoption, and the three of them include the presence of co-benefits. Um, but this condition does not stand alone as a sufficient condition. It occurs in combination with others. 
solution one, for example, supports expectations about stringency, but measured with uh, multi-sectoral coverage rather than with risk of carbon leakage. Risk of carbon leakage was actually only part of solution three, and it shows that in combination with co-benefits, subnational governments may regulate sectors with these characteristics with high risk of carbon leakage, albeit with, of course, several flexibility mechanisms. Um, solution two does not include costs or sectoral scope, and it's the only term that includes the absence of historical opposition to tax reform and the position in the ideological spectrum to propitiate adoption. Um, I found interesting that regulating sectors with high risk of carbon leakage does not necessarily lead to a failed outcome. Failure occurred in jurisdictions that regulate sectors with medium or low risk of carbon leakage as well. Um, solution three covers cases of adoption in jurisdictions where oil and gas were in high risk of carbon leakage. Um, the solutions for the negative outcome give more um, weight to the condition that captures stringency with sectoral coverage rather than with risk of carbon leakage, in fact. Um, so we see that policies that are ambitious in scope may cause similar or more resistance than policies that uh, may potentially cause risk of carbon leakage. Only one of the two solutions for non-adoption uh, includes the absence of co-benefits, solution four, combined with a multi-sectoral coverage. And um, solution five includes this condition of history of resistance to major taxes as a part of the negative outcome. Can we move on to the next slide? Thanks. I devote a large chunk of the chapter to of the um, article to exemplify the configurations with narratives that shows um, the combinations of these conditions at play. Uh, I exemplify adoption with the case of the Regi in New England, which is an instance of this combination of covering only one sector, electricity, and providing co-benefits. I um, exemplify the pathway to non-adoption with the uh, solution four. Um, that has states that, are, that were original members of the initiatives, uh, the Midwestern Greenhouse Gas Reduction Accord and the Western Climate Initiative, except California. Um, it's important to clarify that I did not consider these initiatives as a single carbon pricing policy because states and provinces had the freedom to adjust or to design their own policy. So here I consider the members within these two initiatives, um, the MGGRA and the Western Climate Initiative as separate states. Uh, so for the MGGRA, I have cases like Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Wisconsin. Um, from the WCI, this includes Arizona, New Mexico, among others. Um, and I highlight that um, failures relate to the absence of a clear plan for the use of revenue. Um, and finally, I have a brief section in which I explore cases that did not adjust to expectations whatsoever. And I will return to this section when I address my future research. Um, finally, my conclusions. Um, the results support to an extent that governments can, that can redistribute benefits create a strong incentive for policy adoption. And this is, a, this is a policy relevant finding pointing out that helping those disproportionately affected by the implementation um, or linking mitigation to local development should be a priority. Um, I also uh, highlight that all the sectors with high risk of carbon leakage most definitely influence policy design. They get concessions, flexibility mechanisms. Their presence is not prohibitive in a deterministic way. We have cases such as Alberta in which the oil and gas industry have been compliant and active participants of the design of carbon pricing policies. Of course, obtaining, um, just as I mentioned, plenty of flexibility mechanisms and different ways to comply uh, that environmentalists um, may not agree with. In my conclusions, I also highlight the value of QCA. Um, I, I consider it especially useful for me as um, in its character as a retroductive method. Uh, this term of retroductive, I think, was coined by um, Ryu and Reagan uh, because the QCA allowed me to go back and forth, drop irrelevant conditions according to the results, add new conditions based on the inductive observation of the cases, um, given contradictions in, in the data. 
What I see is a disadvantage of QCA um, was that I wanted to problematize co-benefits further into types of co-benefits, uh, different recipients of co-benefits. Um, but I reached a moment in which I decided to leave that for a, a different paper because I wanted to keep the number of conditions low. And this was a first approximation. Now talking about my ongoing research, how am I doing with time, Katrina? Am I OK? Yeah, if you could if you could wrap up. Yeah, you can go ahead, though. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, in this article, I noticed that several cases that um, contradict that co-benefits are decisive for the outcome. And it was the same states consistently that contradicted my hypothesis, Oregon, Washington State. So I decided to dive deeper into these cases, and that's why, um, that's why I included the condition of history of rejecting changes in the tax structure in the first place, but I wanted to explore that further. Um, so taking this into consideration, I am writing um, this article in which I make the process of coalition building the central causal element in my explanation of adoption or not adoption. Uh, so I have the same research questions, but I explore other literature. Um, and as a research method, there, that, that's where my question comes in. As a research method, I uh, am using longitudinal case studies. One in Canada, um, Alberta, and one in the US, Washington state. In addition to coalition formation, I keep exploring the multi-scalar component of carbon pricing, especially important in Canada. Um, and because the relation between the federal government and provinces has been so contentious there, um, it was also somewhat contentious during the US, the Trump administration in the US. So um, a couple of questions that I, I would like to discuss. If you have any insights, I would be very grateful. Um, one is about this new article and the other one about carbon pricing in general. And my question is, what, what do you make out about the empirical strategy? I do want my conclusions to be generalizable, but with two cases that is um, unlikely, um, especially because I myself admit in the text that there are lessons that we can learn from these cases, but they're not necessarily representative of other jurisdictions. But I believe in the power of narrative and in the power of case studies. I would not want to aggregate observations any further because nuances in this case of coalition building are important, particularly in the non-linear nature of these alliances and their strength, their cohesion, their how, how um, malleable they, they tend to be. So one of the weaknesses of traditional QZA is that it captures foundational moments, right? But it doesn't allow me to do long longitudinal analysis. And these two jurisdictions have had ups and downs with carbon pricing. Alberta has had three policies. Washington has over a dozen failed attempts. So I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, that tension between internal and external validity. And also, given that I have the QZA experts in this virtual room, um, I'd like to know your thoughts about longitudinal QZA. Um, I've heard of it as analysis configurations over time. Has anyone used it? What are its weaknesses, its strengths? Uh, what software would you recommend? And finally, this is my last minute, I promise. The other more general set of questions that I have have to do with the study of carbon pricing versus the study of climate related policy in general. I'm very curious in my own research whether the patterns that I observe in carbon pricing hold in um, energy policy, for example. Um, so how have you integrated research on carbon prices with, with research on mitigation more broadly speaking? Uh, do you perform completely separate analyses or how do you integrate them? I'll shut up now and um, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much again. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing your presentation. Uh, Professor Rabe, would you like to respond and then we can open up the floor for questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I just finished a two year stint chairing a North American climate colloquium involving teams from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the University of Toronto, and my base at the University of Michigan. And Daniela, you know, I really wish we had had this conversation earlier because it would have been really great to bring you in into a project that was looking at all kinds of, just what you were talking about, these sort of different kinds of climate policy tools, but we only dealt peripherally with carbon pricing. So we, we, we need to talk on a number of, of ranges, but I really welcome this paper and also your presentation. For me, it underscores the place we find ourselves in in climate policy now, which is probably not what was expected a decade or two ago, where there was widespread assumption that the world was moving, would ultimately move inexorably towards some kind of a global 
carbon pricing regime that would be a dominant tool and that would involve particularly national level actors working out on a, a, a political agreement as opposed to this issue of federalism, which just comes through in all of your work here, states and provinces and this sort of patchwork quilt of sub-federal commitments uh, within each federal system and crossing over borders. And I think you really ground us in a North American reality with a very large set of sub-federal cases, different cases over time. What has worked in the carbon pricing arena? What has not? And there's a lot in your paper on both sides of that uh, ledger. I particularly welcome, and I thought about these issues a lot, but I learned a great deal by your real emphasis here on co benefits, not just how you set up the price or whether it's cap and trade or a carbon tax or all of these sorts of issues, but how you really think politically about benefits and co-benefits, how you frame them, how you implement them, how you deliver them, how you communicate them. And in my own work, I've really wondered if some of the carbon pricing experiments that have been relatively successful and durable would still be around were it not for in some cases, but not in many others, this ability to think about co-benefits, as you point out, and I love the phrasing, that are visible, that are local, and are immediate. And so, you know, we have tons of survey research on what'll move the needle on public opinion and how you might spend money, but you're talking about this in real political contexts and cases where the answers to those questions, especially the local and immediate, may vary from place to place or moment to moment. It's a very different kind of a calculation. You also touch nicely and appropriately on leakage, which are invariably going to be concerns when you get into sub-federal policy, carbon pricing or other arenas. Um, a very important reminder, given the fact that so many jurisdictions that have started uh, carbon pricing policy did not carry through. The difference between considering a policy or in many cases issuing an executive proclamation or an executive order is in the Midwestern case. And then actually adopting policy through statute or an equivalent and then implementing it. Those are all different stages. And it's really important. And we have some opportunities now, as you know, because there's been a, a history here in a lot of jurisdictions to really weigh in and think about this. I also really welcome in your paper, your focus on a state's history of taxation. I don't think that this has gotten enough treatment, but you really bring this out beautifully toward the end where you're looking at especially Oregon and Washington. And we often tend in climate discussions to say, you know, in the US, we live in this hyper-partisan world and so progressive blue states are more likely to adopt policies, but don't really think about the underlying conditions. And a big one is, as you know, in states that don't pass sales taxes and fight income taxes, these sorts of things, does that then influence how they might look at, at a carbon pricing um, regime? Then there's also uh, some interesting discussion here, and I, you know, I wanna come back to this in a moment, about federalism, the wild card, and you are quote agnostic about the direction of its effects. Totally understand that, totally legitimate, but a big question I will have for you going forward is how do we weigh that and think about that, especially when we put these individual states or regions into a more a federal or a, a national kind of a, a context. What emerges here is that this is a policy tool, carbon pricing that has a lot of challenges politically, a lot more than its early proponents ever wanted to acknowledge. And yet it has some capacity. And as we've seen in the 117th Congress, other policy tools are not easy slam dunks. There's no one wink, wink, here's what you do to politically get climate policy through. So some questions and thoughts going forward, although I've already hinted at them. One is, I found the paper for a paper that's framed as North American, very heavily United States focused. Um, issues like the pan-Canadian framework or more depth on some of the early provincial cases. You mentioned more work coming in Alberta or even some of the early Mexican state experiments or considerations of this. I'd love to hear more or see more in future work on the Canada-US side of this North American partnership in a paper that is 
very heavily focused in this, particularly when you're unpacking cases on, on the United States. Secondly, and you talked about this some in your presentation, I think there's this growing issue of policy complementarity. I would argue around the world that the jurisdictions that adopt and sustain carbon pricing are also places that are likely to develop lots of other policies. And so this question of complementarity or fit between them in terms of implementation, but also politics, particularly in cases where you may need a carbon price, not just to set that price, but to pay for some of these other policies, which largely wasn't discussed very much or thought of 15 or 20 years ago, is potentially as you dig into, say, a Reggie case, or certainly in a place like Alberta that's been kind of dancing around carbon pricing for almost 20 years, back to the Ralph Klein era, um, it does come into play. If there's sort of one big question that emerges for me from your paper, and it's not really a criticism, I think it's time for a sequel, is that you had to cut off from your time period of 2006 through 2020. And like climate policy history has marched on since you, you had to, to, to cut off and, and a few questions that emerged for me. Um, what do we make of this pan-Canadian framework? Uh, political economy, it makes absolutely no sense for a small, compared to the United States regime, to develop a very robust carbon pricing mechanism, a really complicated one, when the U.S. gives every indication it's going to continue to shirk, and yet their Canada is. How do we explain that? How do we understand that? Is Canada really in this for the long game or not? There are some real opportunities and questions that I that emerged for me there, um, including the period of like 2019, 2020, when you're still completing your analysis. What's the run up to that unexpected, at least from my own perspective, development? You spend a lot of time unpacking Reggie toward the end of the paper, which is terrific. Uh, what do we think about all the things that are going on? That Reggie is now going through its third program review with some big, big time issues on the table major cap adjustments, policy complementarity, environmental justice, reallocating and redefining co-benefits. What happens if Pennsylvania through an executive order actually doubles the size of Reggie in all of your categories? And is that a serious policy or should we just put that in a different box because the legislature is actively opposed to that policy? What about Virginia? How do we think about Reggie as it shrinks, expands or his pancaked in the area of transportation, a 10-year area to extend Reggie from the electricity sector to transportation seemingly has collapsed. And then third and finally, how do we think about all of these sub-federal experiments in a world in which carbon border adjustment mechanisms, CBAM, is beginning to emerge in some really, really significant um, ways? How does North American climate policy work when the American climate carbon price stays presumably at zero? Canada moves toward presumably $170 a ton by the end of the decade, and Mexico stays around $1, as I understand it, and exempts natural gas. Um, what happens to uh, the U.S., Mexico, Canadian, uh, the new North American trade agreement? Uh, which speaks nothing specific to climate, but has review mechanisms and is binding to some extent at the very point where we begin to talk about uh, border and other kinds of adjustments. What happens in a world of CBAM where Quebec, because it's part of the Canadian Federation, is presumably protected, but California, its trading partner, works in the United States. Does California get protection under CBAM? And with it, if you have some difference between states in a federation that do or do not do carbon pricing that they are in or not in a federal regime um, do more states become interested in carbon pricing if it means that this could give them a free pass or a freer pass on, on on cbam and these other kinds of things and then finally what about the relationships between these sub-federal and national actors i just love to watch canadian diplomats talk about how they would view court carbon border adjustment in a world where they now hold all the cards. They're clearly waiting for the European Union to take the lead, but they know they've taken steps that those Americans have not taken. What does that look like? What does that mean? And in these systems where 
the states and provinces have so much impact on what the federal government does. Uh, as we begin to talk more about linking climate policy to trade protection, including most other state policy instruments, which have loads of provisions to try to protect economic benefits and keep those within a state or a province's boundaries. How do all of these issues work together? That's a terribly unfair question to put upon you for this paper, but it underscores my hope that you'll be kind of taking up the, whenever you cut this off in 2020, and again, I totally understand why you did that, the 2020 to wherever we are, uh, you know, going forward. So with that, I really appreciate the paper. I appreciate the invitation and I learned a great deal and look forward to our conversation. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you for your comments. Uh, Professor Stevens, would you like to respond and then we can take some questions? Of course, I mean, to the to the extent that I can respond to all these wonderful questions, you, you gave me a great deal to think about. Um, I do. I do remain agnostic about federalism, um, and it's a it's a sincere agnosticism. I, I truly wanted to explore what really happened and what happened with federalism, not federalism alone, but federalism interacting with other circum with other yeah um, subnational circumstances. I think that's why QZA was so um, so important for me uh, because isolating federalism, um, I, I don't think was productive. Um, so we have to think about federalism in terms of who is in power, um, the industries that you're trying to cover. So it, it's one among many other uh, conditions in combination. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it was not um, so salient in this paper, because other conditions took precedence. It is very heavily US based. You're right. It, it was not my original intent, but um, those are the cases that I thought would exemplify better my my combinations. But in this new paper, I am exploring Alberta. I am exploring. Um, I am doing so much research, um, policy research regarding, for example, Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan. So what is happening with um, these provinces and the um, court decisions that are still ongoing. What happened with the federal court um, in Alberta, what happened in Saskatchewan, in Manitoba. Um, so I think Canada is my, um, my, my next paper will be very uh, heavily Canada focused. Unfortunately, there is not much that I can uh, do with Mexico because there are, after Zacatecas, there have not been any other serious attempts. I think the state of Sonora considered it lightly. Um, but it was just a consideration that I, that the, the Ministry of, of Environment discussed and that the executive did not mention it. So I have these three cases, um, Jalisco, which joined the under two memorandum of understanding and after that didn't do anything. Uh, Chiapas, which at one point considered to join the WCI, um, not as a trading partner, but as a, a provider of offsets. Um, in the end, it was considered as um, too unstable because there are there are many um, land contestation issues um, by indigenous communities, by rural communities. So um, Chiapas was out of the out of the equation for the WCI for almost from the outset. Um, so yes, I, I I wish there we had more um, material to work with in Mexico. The relation with the federal government with Zacatecas I found really fascinating and worthy of a different paper on its own because the government that enacted the federal carbon price, the government of Peña Nieto with the PRI, was the government that contested the subnational carbon price in Zacatecas with exactly the same uh, party governing the state. Um, and the reason I thought was just a, a matter of power and a matter of who has the power to deal with these industries. Is it going to be you, Zacatecas? Is, is, is it going to be me, the federal government? How am I going to um, regulate mining, which is one of the main activities, economic activities, not only in the state, but in Mexico as a whole? Um, what do we, I find the pan-Canadian framework so fascinating, and I, I agree with you that it would contradict every political economy hypothesis that we would have. What is going on with oil and gas? Why have they been compliant, especially you know in Alberta or in manufacturing states? And that's why I'm exploring this other condition of coalition building. And exploring specifically what happened 20 years ago um, with the conservative government in Alberta and how the conservative government got to negotiate with oil and gas, were they concessions made um, 
what were the conditions under which the, the first SGER, um, the special gas emissions regulation was negotiated? Um, why did they accept it to begin with? Um, and then again, it comes the, uh, the condition of stringency, of policy stringency. The SGER was not very stringent. It would get some money, yes, to reinvest on, on, on some green investments. Um, the cap was exceedingly high. So I'm exploring how, who, who gave what to whom, who agreed to what, um, given this specific um, coalition building uh, condition. But also um, the, the Canadian provinces impetus to start carbon pricing before the federal government did it and do carbon pricing in their own terms. That was yet another co-benefits, restating their own autonomy and also designing the policy so that they could get themselves uh, the, the revenue and, and uh, decide what to do with the revenue. So that's another, uh, that, that condition would also fall under political economy, right? But also under poli politics, like who, who has the power to make the choice? The federal government, the, the provincial government. So that was yet another strong incentive for all these provinces, not only including Alberta, but um, Manitoba, and all these provinces that have um, conservative leadership that five, three years ago attempted to price carbon and that entered into this um, quarrelsome relationship with the Federation that then moved to the courts. Um, I honestly could not say what about Reggie now, <laughs> but I, I will I will leave that for 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 my further research. Although, like I, I'm telling you right now, I'm focusing more on, on Canada, but I do find fascinating this um, transportation initiative. And given that transportation has been perhaps the, the hardest sector to cover, even more than industry, even more than any other, it is transportation. So uh, exploring that is, is very worthy. Um, yeah, I would like to leave it there and see. If, uh, thank you so much, Professor Rabe. Um, uh, I hope to continue our conversation maybe via email, but it would be really, really productive for me to to get more of your feedback. Um, yes, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so we can open up the Q&A now and I see Katya's hand went up first. And if anyone else has questions, they can just raise their hand and I'll take them in order. Oh, yes. Oh, can I say something? I'm also curious about um, Professor Rafe's research. If you could share some 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 thoughts about that, that would be great. Okay, maybe we'll turn it over to Professor Rabe and then we can go to Katya's question, if that's okay. As you wish, as you wish. Oh, why don't we go to the other questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, Kat Katya, you have a question? Well, I'm thank happy, you. I'm yes, back uh, later, but, yeah. <laughs> indeed, and I think we just maybe have to organize a, a whole webinar or conversation dedicated to, uh, to Barry's work. Um, so maybe there can be a follow up as well. Uh, but thanks a lot. Uh, I have actually many questions and I need to choose. Um, but yeah, certainly I find your, your research very fascinating and, and a very important and uh, topic and a topic that really has changed a lot over the course of time. I, you know, actually, when reading your paper and listening to you, I thought back in 2012, I did interviews with the people who were involved in um, Reggie in, well, California mainly, but the WCI and also the Midwestern Initiative. And back then, um, this whole question of justice and co-benefits actually didn't come out very clearly. And I and I think really now, ten years later, the the whole debate uh, and 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 yeah, the politics around those issues really have changed. And I think that's um, that's really fascinating and kind of you know, supports the point that you raised that currently you don't have a temporal dimension to your research. And I think. Um, that that probably is really one aspect that uh, yeah that that would be very interesting and fascinating for you to maybe look at in, in more detail. Um, but actually, the question or the comment that I wanted to make is about um, so you look at co benefits, mm -hmm. um, and I actually recently uh, started looking more and more into justice mm -hmm. and public acceptability. And you know, and, and on the first side, I thought. Oh, our research is very similar. But then when thinking about the co-benefits and, and what you mentioned, um, they're not necessarily just, like in the sense of socially just. So we yeah. have this other uh, debate and, and there's quite some research in on carbon taxes, not necessarily on ETSs, 
on public acceptability, when do uh, normal citizens uh, perceive a carbon tax, just uh, when would they support it, when wouldn't they support it. Um, and that, you know, to some extent is very similar to what you do, but then also very different. So, so one other aspect um, that I, you mentioned already, and I think would be very interesting is really to disentangle the co-benefits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what what are they? Um, are, are there really qualitative differences? Uh, and I think there are. Mm -hmm. And then linking that to this, you know, the research that I just uh, mentioned, that's public acceptability. But and then that leads to my actual question for you. Um, who actually needs to be convinced by the cove benefits for those policies to be adopted? And I was wondering, you know, is it the public or is it different or certain kinds of politicians. And that's sometimes um, in your research, you know, I found a little bit blurry. I, I wasn't sure where to situate it in, in kind of the policy cycle. You know, is mm -hmm. this really in the process of drafting the policy or more the politics of adopting it? And does that actually make a difference? So, yeah, I'm not sure to what extent this is questions, um, but uh, but I, I really thought that there's there's a lot in, in those questions where there's, um, yeah, where you could contribute with additional research and, and really trying to disentangle those questions. Thanks a lot. Yes, yes, absolutely. Your, I think your, your comments, your questions are absolutely on point. Co-benefits uh, do not necessarily equate justice. Um, one of the co-benefits could be justice or not. Um, I have this case of, uh, of Zacatecas that I found really fascinating in which the governor said we need money that's going to be the benefit that's why I'm willing to uh, fight with the mining um, union that's why I'm willing to take on the Canadian miners because we need money we, we no longer have the money from uh, federal oil and we are in debt so we need more revenue this is the only reason there is not even an environmental or a climate reason why we're adopting a carbon tax we need the money um, there are other cases in which, for example, the population was not even going to get rebates or anything, but the, the assertion of autonomy was um, the co-benefit for, for the province of British Columbia, for example, which was carbon neutral and wasn't going to give anybody any extra, <laughs> extra money, but um, they took the lead and they were the, the carbon pricing leaders in, in Canada. So I agree with you that there is a, so much to tease out from, from the co-benefits. Um, who needs to be convinced? The politicians, the legislator. Um, so yes, there, there, are, there are different. I, I really like the way you frame it, where in the policy cycle they fall. Uh, and I believe it's in my, in, in this case, I'm arguing that it's in the drafting of the policy. Um, in the early stages of who's gonna get what if this gets implemented. Um, it could be the public or not. It could be mainly the government. Um, so that's something that I that I'm looking forward to to teasing out. Um, so thank you for your comment. And I don't see any hands, but I actually have a question also kind of in line with uh, what Katia was talking about. Um, so I wonder how highlighting co-benefits could be exploited by actors that are opposed to carbon pricing policies and could be yeah i guess i would just leave it there it's uh it could work for or against the policy i think and i think that's a important point to bring up yeah yeah can you elaborate a bit further how you think this can play out absolutely so um for instance in the zacatecas case couldn't the mining industries that would be regulated or have the carbon tax, I think it is uh, imposed on them. Couldn't they just say this isn't even an environmental policy? The government's just trying to get money. So it could oh, they, be yeah. <laughs> the, the, the co benefit, the incentive to implement a CPP for its co benefits could be oh I see used in the narrative to say that this isn't actually a an environmental. Uh, climate policy and then yeah it could create like it could become more politicized mm -hmm. I guess. yeah yeah absolutely i understand and in my research all the carbon pricing uh, are framed that way all of them by industry by the public by any industry that you mentioned not only not only oil and gas the manufacturing industry argues that it's only for the purposes of revenue 
and that this is not actually an environmental policy, but an extractive kind of uh, attempt. So I think that already happens, and this absolutely happened in the case of Zacatecas. Um, governor was very criticized, but nonetheless, the policy had the majority on the, on the government. That's why I also included the, the, the condition of, is there a quote-unquote unified government in the case of Mexico and U.S.? And in the case of, uh, of Canada, there was always a, a, a different kind of government that's unified, right? But um, yeah, that happens absolutely all the time, almost all the time. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and that has not been um, a very strong criticism, you know, not, not a very, um, it, it's a valid criticism, but it hasn't uh, changed how, if, they, if the policy ends up being adopted or, or not. But I, I definitely see what you mean. Yeah, the narrative can get twisted, right? In a very cynic, yeah, in a very cynic way. Definitely. Uh, Martin, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Katrina. Daniela, congratulations for this paper. It's really interesting. Uh, the, yeah, the focus on subnational jurisdictions, uh, I think that is something lacking overall. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, continuing with the co-benefits, that is also an interesting concept. Uh, I mean, uh, as I know it uh, before this paper, it was, um, yeah, how the IPCC uses it and it's more like the ancillary objectives of the policy. Um, and in this case, uh, I, yeah, I was wondering if, if you're almost like assuming that almost all these policies are really about the, uh, yeah, uh, mitigation, let's say, or for example, in this case of Zacatecas is clearly not about that. And actually maybe the, the, the environmental goal is the co-benefit. And, it's, yeah, and the revenue is actually the, the main goal of the policy. So, so I was wondering basically how do you identify these co-benefits? Because you say that this should be visible, local and immediate. And uh, I mean, I haven't looked at your cases, but at least in others, uh, I've seen that um, that actually policymakers include a lot of objectives in the policy that are not really implementable or are just to frame the, the policy. Mm -hmm. So how do you, do you uh, differentiate between these two, the, the overall framing and actual co-benefits that you can measure afterwards? Mm -hmm. uh, and then second was about the leakage. Um, because yeah, I was thinking that maybe in subnational jurisdictions, the leakage risk is uh, more real, let's say, than, in, than in, at national level. So do you think that, uh, do you have any sort of insights on this? Do you think that it's more uh, salient the leakage discussion in subnational jurisdiction than in yeah at the national level. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Martin. Um, you know, I had not thought about your your first question about what's the difference between the overall framing because here I'm focusing on on the draft. I'm focusing on how how politicians sold the carbon price, not actually on the next step of implementation. Um, but I think you're absolutely right in that. Sometimes promises are made and they're not delivered upon. Um, in the case, I have a few cases, for example, Reggie, um, we have evidence that yes, there were some co-benefits, not only for, for the um, consumer, but also for the governments. Like they could pay some debt with, with the revenues. Um, so yes, there is evidence that there are actual co-benefits, but um, you're right that not in all the cases um, this holds true. I do believe the leakage is more salient. I don't know if it's more salient, but it's very salient in, because the threat of um, leaving town is real in, when it comes to subnational jurisdiction. So I can move from Washington to Oregon and yeah, that threat is uh, very much real and where I get um, more leniency regarding taxes. And yes, yes, it's, it's definitely more real. Um, although I think that Nationally, it can also be be real, especially you know going to Southeast Asia to to do your manufacturing. That's also um, the case with carbon taxes and carbon pricing in general. Um, thank you for your questions. You give me a lot to think about. Um, I want to add something to Katya's and um, Katrina's question. The the this research did not, at, although I can derive policy relevant uh, conclusions, it was not meant to be a normative uh, sort of research, right? So argue that this should be done or that uh, this is for the sake of environmental justice. It's not that kind of research. I would love to, to uh, pursue that kind of research as well, but this is 
purely empirical what happens and um, it ends up not being fair absolutely <laughs> co benefits I, I don't argue that are fair definitely and katya you have a comment question <laughs> many but if anyone else wants to uh, ask or uh, say something please go for me but otherwise i do actually you know like maybe link to what, what you just said um one thing I was wondering, and um, kind of maybe it's also based on these earlier uh, interviews that I had 10 years ago. Um, your model is very much a rational actor model. You know, if there are more co-benefits, then we all uh, assume that it's better and then we support it. Um, one case that that reminded me of where this did not happen is um, in uh, New Jersey when they left Reggie. So initially New Jersey uh, joined Reggie, then Chris Christie for purely political reasons, nothing to do with climate or other policy itself, um, took New Jersey out of uh, Reggie, although they made money and it was perfect. Well, you know, I'm <laughs> exaggerating, but it, but it was working well on all the parameters, including COBE benefits. So that was much more ideology, politics, playing mm -hmm. with that and, and not necessarily a very rational actor um, assumption that you could apply. So I was just wondering whether uh, you know, has this changed or not? Or did you come across uh, also these, um, yeah, you know, very unexplicable um, actions by certain politicians? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I would, I would, I would ask you in turn: is it is it not rational to act politically? Um, so I think that rationality uh, could hold. But I agree with you that um, following the rationality of co-benefits, this was not rational. Reggie does not hold. Um, however, in my in my whole contention, I, I do argue that this is not a deterministic model, it's probabilistic. And um, I include this condition of left-right to try to capture that politicization of, of Reggie. Was it a, a left-wing government that, that um, adopted it? Was it a right-wing government? Unfortunately, what I do not do is to include the cases that were um, uh, in which there was a, a reversal. Um, in that case, I would know, was there a change? I could include a condition. Is there a change of government, um, of party, of ideology? And after that change, was the policy repealed? Um, I think that would be a good way of, of capturing that um, movement. Of, there was a single policy, but um, there was change. And then back on to, to Reggie again. Um, but yeah, I would, I would know. I agree with you on the one hand that it, it is not rational in the context of co-benefits. The same thing happened in, in Ontario uh, with change of government. They repealed the, the, the ETS in that case. Um, but I would also think that it's it was not irrational if you have um, a rationale of a, a politically minded rationale. Absolutely. And then uh, Professor Ray, if you can do the last question. Thanks. Are we at? We have a hard stop at the hour, though. Oh, uh, we can we can stop a few minutes after. That's fine, as long as that's okay, okay with everyone's schedule. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I declined an invitation to, to keep going, but I'm going to just would throw one other piece in, and I I wanted to just ask Daniela if you've thought about all of this in the context of any of the other greenhouse gases, most notably methane. Um, I've been thinking and struggling with this, but. I've really been struck by, for example, in the US, almost mm -hmm. all production states, which would never adopt a carbon price, have upstream severance taxes on extraction, mm -hmm. often set very high. In fact, the more conservative the state in some areas, the higher their tax. Texas, for example, Alaska, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Almost all of those states, though, have expressly put methane exemptions. So if you talk about flaring, that's natural gas that has market value if captured, but is exempt. Um, <laughs> this has begun to surface in the US in unexpected intensity in the current Congress, where actually a 15, nine, it ultimately was $900 a ton methane fee, fee passed the US House and has about as much support in the Senate as the entire Build Back Better provision. It's just, it's a remarkable development. What I don't know is the Mexican production st side or the Canadian side of this, but I wonder if you've thought at all about 
co-benefit framing along these lines or any of the other things that you're thinking about for any of the other greenhouse gases, uh, HFC transition, black carbon, but most notably methane because, well, it's just so large it cuts across multiple sectors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have thought about methane a lot, um, only recently for, for the U.S., but currently I'm also working on a paper uh, about Brazil and about how Brazil constructed its nationally determined contributions. And you know that Brazil has a relatively green um, energy matrix, but its main emissions are derived from agriculture. And there's also a, a, a very, I wouldn't say a salient debate, but a broad debate in the legislature um, about agriculture, because the agricultural lobby, the ruralista bench, is, has a, is a very strong presence um, in Brazil. They help Bolsonaro get to the presidency, they finance his campaign, so I'm framing that as well, who, who has the power in the legislature and what what is the, the gas that they would be more interesting about? In Brazil, it's not about CO2, it's about methane. It's somewhat about CO2 too because of the land use um, and the change in land use uh, that releases more CO2. Uh, but in this context of, the, of Brazilian politics, I think methane is, is very salient. Um, I haven't thought about it in the context of Canada or, or Mexico, uh, only US and what you're mentioning and Brazil. Um, but I, that's that's fascinating, and I again, you're, you've given me so much to to think about. Wonderful. Well, that uh, yeah, we're right on time. But again, this was the first of our hopefully monthly uh, webinar series, and thank you for um, yeah joining and sharing in this conversation about carbon pricing policies. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep you informed whenever there are future papers and research that we're going to share. And, and thank you again, Professor Stevens and Professor Rabe, for for all of your good input. Thank you so much for for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone, have a good day then. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.